um, you, you know, that the basic facts of the situation are pretty clear. Uh, the temperatures, global temperatures have been warming. Humans emit CO2 into the atmosphere. CO2 has an infrared emission spectra, which overall acts to warm the planet. But there's a lot of disagreement about the most consequential issues. How much of the warming has been human caused? Um, <clears throat> How important is human-caused warming relative to solar variability, ocean circulation patterns, and so on? So, so there is some very legitimate disagreements, you know, about this topic. And myself and others that are in this category that you're talking about, we don't dispute the basics. What we do, dis what we do object to, is the idea of a manufactured consensus for political purposes. This is not a natural scientific consensus that has emerged over a long time. It's a manufactured consensus of scientists, you know, at the request of policymakers, which has been too narrowly framed. There's too much politics in it. And, you know, that, that's what I object to. And there's a number of other scientists that object to this as well. And because, and we've also been critical of the behavior of some of the more politically active scientists who are exaggerating the truth and the interests <laughs> of, of a good story or political objectives or whatever. So, so that's what it's about. It's not about any fundamental scientific disagreement other than maybe levels of confidence, you know, in, in certain findings. Well, I um, so yeah, yeah, the attention, I mean, the attention is really shifted to these extreme weather events, you know, hurricanes and floods and heat waves and whatever, but there's very little evidence to talk. I mean, that's really part of natural weather and climate variability. You know, any signal from global warming usually can't be teased out. Um, in terms of these events and um, attempting to say, oh, this is global warming, you know, the floods in Pakistan and Hurricane Ian and whatever, you know, it's, it's possible that there's a minuscule component from the overall global warming, but it's very difficult to tease out from natural variability. These events would have happened anyways, <laughs> you know, you know, with possibly some minor change associated with the warming, but you can't really decipher that in an objective way. So, but, but people are trying to, you know, there's a whole bunch of complicated motives here. Um, to, if you're an academic scientist working in the climate area and you want to advance and get grant money and professional recognition, you would be well served to hew to the alarmist narrative. I mean, the people who are getting professional recognition and being put in charge of big institutes and centers are all alarmists. I mean, who, who speak about doom and gloom and exaggerate. And how far is react? Okay, I'm in the middle. Okay. People are being sued left and right over bad weather, you know, governments, oil companies and everything. They're not doing enough. people who think that they can control the climate <laughs> by, you know, it, it's just a pipe dream. Uh, even if we went to net zero, we would barely notice. It would be hard to de detect any change in the climate. The climate's going to do what the climate's going to do. And there's a lot of inertia in the system. If what if the carbon dioxide that we put in is as important, as bad as some people seem to think those effects are going to be with us for a very, very long time. And stopping now isn't going to, <laughs> you know, change that trajectory very much. So. You know, we just need to look forward and try to understand what's happened. But thinking that we're going to control the climate by going to net zero very quickly is not good. But the gloom and doom, I mean, compared to pre-industrial is held up as some sort of, you know, golden age <laughs> you know, that we're supposed to go back to. Well, pre-industrial, you know, the, the weather was horrible. This was at the end of the little ice age. You know, it's the coldest period of the millennium. I mean, there, there were horrible famines and extreme weather and extremely terribly cold winters and springs and things like that. This, that was not good weather. The weather now is much better. Even look more recently, I mean, look more recently, I mean, at least in the US where I've looked most carefully, the, the weather was much worse in the 1930s by any measure. You know, forest fires, droughts, heat waves, hurricanes, everything that you can imagine in the US was much worse in the 1930s. Does anybody remember that? Well, no, most of those people are no longer living. But if you look at the data, there it says. Most people have just look at the data since 1950 or 1970. The 1970s and 1980s, that was a relatively benign period of weather. And so if you just do the trend since 1970, oh, the weather is worse now. Well, yes, but it's not worse than the 1930s or 40s or even the 50s. So it's just, and people are able, to, people are much more prosperous globally. Poverty is way down. Life expectancy is up. You know, we're doing very well, you know, as we reduce poverty and human development advances. A lot of that has been, you know, fueled by petroleum and coal. Um, are there better fuels out there? Um, well, hopefully in the future there will be, you know, advanced nuclear and stuff like that, very promising advanced geothermal. But right now, this minute, I mean, having our entire energy infrastructure relying on wind turbines and solar energy is, is going to cause a lot of harm to a lot of people, um, not j just to the overall econ economy. You can't run an industrial economy on wind and solar, at least <laughs> the way it's currently um, envisioned. It requires a huge land footprint, which people, at least in the U.S., people are even the sort of environmental people are fighting against new transmission lines and wind turbines 
because of various perceived ecological impacts. You know, so you know, you know that nobody wants a landscape covered with wind turbines and transmission lines. Um, you know, just people haven't thought this out. That and th there's no emergency. <laughs> I mean. Economically, you know, even these economic scenarios, we're all expected to be worldwide, like four times better off economically by the end of the 21st century. And a little bit of that might be shaved off because of damages from global warming. But we're, we're all going to be better off, you know, moving forward through the 21st century, unless we do really stupid stuff, like just destroy our energy infrastructure before we have something better to replace it with. Okay, that's the biggest danger. The biggest climate risk right now is the so-called transition risk, the risk of rapidly getting rid of fossil fuels. Yeah, I mean, I'm no fan of pollution and crazy price spikes and whatever. I'd love to see inexpensive, cleaner, reliable, secure energy, you know, better than what we have now. But going to 100% renewables is not, <laughs> is not a better solution. Um, it's, it's, yeah, the, the storage people talk about, well, hydrogen backup is right. All of this is decades away. Um, the time between now and 2050 needs to be a period of technological development and experimentation, which different countries, different states, trying different things, see what works. And from there, you know, some good solutions will emerge. But trying to mandate that everybody goes to wind and solar is going to be an unmitigated disaster. The, the supply chain for all of this doesn't exist right now. Um, you know, it's mater very material intensive. Um, we have established, you know, pipelines for fuels, for coal and, and gas and, and oil and everything, although that's obviously been disrupted by the situation in Russia right now. But, you know, we can maneuver that. But we have that in place. We do not have the supply chain in place for all the materials that we need for wind and solar and batteries and whatever. So people have all these plans and they just can't get the materials right now. So, you know, we just need to accept that we're going to need decades, you know, at least three to figure all this out. And certainly by the end of the 21st century, we, we could have a really good power infrastructure in place with abundant, clean and expensive power, but not if we fritter away all our efforts right now <clears throat> on wind and solar, that's going to actually damage our economies. So we're going to be less likely to be able to really make the transition in the way that we need to, um, that will really support more people and the need for more electricity. Thinking that we're going to need less energy going forward is a pipe dream. I mean, we want more energy, electricity, especially if we're going to electric vehicles and heat pumps and, and all the fancy things that we want to do with artificial intelligence and machine learning and robotics and whatever, all that needs electricity too. So we're going to need more electricity, not less. Mm -hmm. so, so we need to figure this out. And wind and solar, why it's an, a near-term partial solution and maybe a niche solution <clears throat> for some places, it's not a long-term global solution. Yeah, I mean, it, even if we're going to transition to all wind and solar, we're going to need a lot of fossil fuels to accomplish that, for to establish, to do all the mining and establish the supply chains and all the transport and everything else. So in the near term, even if the plan is to go to all renewable um, wind and solar, then you're going to need a lot of fossil fuels to get us there. Right? You know, it's just, a, you know, people just repeat these mantras without any thought, you know, and they, you know, you know, I don't know, it's not a good place, more visible. And, and there's nothing exceptional about much of anything that's been going on. It seems like a lot, but, you know, and, and it's, a lot of it is that the natural um, ocean oscillations, which really determines the seasonal weather. And, you know, we're in a bad spell since about 2017. We've just been in a bad spell for five years. And once we see a shift in the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation and this, that, and the other, things will calm down for a while. It's just that we've been in a really bad <laughs> you know, place for about five years. Yeah, these combinations of circulation patterns, you know, happen and bring with it bad weather. So, um, and we'll cycle out of this, you know, on the time scale, five to 10 years probably. And then maybe we'll see a calmer period with another more active period. And these things are regional. So, you know, there's a lot of natural weather and climate variability and trying to tie each little thing that happens to the slow creep of global warming. Um, it's, it's wrong scientifically and it's counterproductive in terms of actually dealing with this stuff. I mean, even if we go to net zero by 2050, we're still going to have floods in Pakistan and Hurricane Ian and stuff like that. We're still going to have it. So spending more time and money trying to figure out how to increase the resilience, especially in these developing countries to bad hurricanes. And that, you know, the, the, the biggest tragedy of all this is a lot of the, the, you know, the development funds from World Bank and all these kind of things has been refocused on wind and solar rather than on development and adaptation and reducing vulnerability. And so these countries are actually in a worse place. <laughs> than if the climate change narrative hadn't been around. So this is actually interfering in with development. I mean, countries like the U.S. can, you know, survive these weather disasters. I mean, it costs money and a few people might even lose their lives, but we bounce right back and, you know, we try to make it better. But in, but in these developing countries, 
Pakistan. I, I mean, this stuff is relentlessly impoverishing. Every time one of these disasters hit, they, they just don't have the resilience to cope. I mean, they all live on the edge. They wipe out their crop. You know, they, they've borrowed money, you know, to buy their seeds and this, that, and the other, and then it wipes out and they go further into debt. It's just relentlessly impoverishing. And better forecast, better weather forecasting and climate forecasting, better operational procedures can go a long way towards helping in these countries. And that's what my little company is trying to do. Um, but infrastructure, better infrastructure, and that includes energy. And, and once you have an energy infrastructure you can develop. Now, Bangladesh is one of the bigger success stories here. I mean, you're too young to remember, like in the 70s, when Bangladesh was the world's biggest basket case. I remember it because George Harrison, the Beatle, you know, had all these concerts for Bangladesh. <laughs> okay, But that was the world's biggest basket case. Now Bangladesh is doing great. They, um, they developed their own natural gas and fossil fuel resources. We actually helped in a small way with the flood forecasting and helped them developing plans to evacuate and, and manage around the floods. But the, the life expectancy has advanced substantially. The birth rate has lowered to a saner level. And now they've got a real economy. OK, and they ignored a lot of the advice from places like World Bank. Oh, you need to wind and solar and this, that and the other. So, so they sort of went their own way and they're doing really well. OK, and, you know, having the right politicians, <laughs> you know, in country. But the point is, you have these countries have to develop on their own. And sometimes you get a good leader and it tends to happen. And Bangladesh is a success story. Vietnam is up and coming. You know, there's some success stories out there and there's some other ones that, oh my gosh, you know, it just seems like a basket case. How do, how, how do we help? And, you know, disasters, weather and climate disasters just wipe those countries out. And so trying to figure out the development and the adaptation piece for these countries, this is where we could do the world the most good, not trying to get them, you know, allow Africa to develop its own fossil fuel resources so they can develop, you know, and give them a little bit of help. Right now, their resources are being exploited and sent to Europe, okay, rather than being used in country because they don't have the power plants. It's a, and it doesn't take that much to give them some power plants and help them develop an infrastructure, and then Africa could take off. But because of global warming and all that kind of stuff, the powers that be aren't lending or giving Africa the resources that they need to develop these resources. And that's, to me, that's the biggest crime on the planet right now. Um, it's a very the warming of planet Earth. No. <laughs> no. Um, you've got, okay, the sun throughout... <laughs> you know, and it's terrible for their health. Oh, it's renewable. Wood and dung is renewable. <laughs> yeah, and it, it just leads us to do so many stupid things. You don't know what you're supposed to do, and somehow it all just comes together. And then you don't know why you wouldn't have known it in the first place. By studying geometry. Is the warming of the earth necessarily a bad thing? No, not necessarily. I mean, this whole issue of dangerous is the weakest part of the whole argument and things that go on. Okay. Is one of the primary takeaways for me when you look at environmental activists is their what looks like a very solid conclusion that human beings are not compatible with the longevity of planet Earth. Is there any truth to this? No. <laughs> no, the Earth is going to be fine. I mean, the Earth has survived much worse than humans. <laughs> you know, asteroid strikes and all sorts of indignities. Uh, you know, so the planet Earth is going to be fine. And, you know, species... ...conclusion that human beings are not compatible with the longevity of planet Earth. Is there any truth to this? No. <laughs> no, the Earth is going to be fine. I mean, the Earth has survived much worse than humans. <laughs> you know, asteroid strikes and all sorts of indignities. Uh, you know, so the planet Earth is going to be fine. And, you know, species and life, you know, evolves, moves, changes. They said, oh, my gosh, you know, this species has moved a little bit further north. <laughs> so what? Um, you, you know, the Earth has survived far bigger insults <laughs> than, than what humans are doing. That said, <laughs> you know, we should not be, you know, careless. You know about our home planet we, we should do our best to keep it you know clean and to minimize our footprint you know where we can but you know thinking that the earth is fragile um you know i think you know it, it's a worldview that you know doesn't really align very well with reality um you know think about it eight billion people is pretty remarkable you know that they're managing on planet earth um yeah i mean developed countries have a lower environmental footprint than you know like say what's going on in the u.s in terms of the environment is much better than what's going on in Africa, because like I said, they have to burn wood and cut trees down and you know this, that, and the other j just to survive, just to survive. And you know, when it's a survival issue, you know, you're being much harder on the environment. And when you don't have an economy, the, the reproduction rate and the population growth is very, very high. Um, you know, once you, I mean, the pop, the rate of growth of Bangladesh population, you know, was like population doubling in a tiny amount of time, and now it's regulated you know some you know that's very close to what i would say developed world standards and that's what 
economic development does. You don't need to reproduce so much to uh, survive. So we, number one goal should be human thriving and flourishing. And that does imply some care of our natural resources and preserving of our environment, but that's not the dominant goal, you know, just to let the environment, you leave the environment alone. I mean, that's just a non-starter with 8 billion people. What? Well, <clears throat> how shall I say? Okay. In the academic world, I faced a lot of consequences. I mean, I, I clearly wasn't going to advance any further. My employers wanted me gone. I was essentially unhirable. Um, I was out of the loop for any professional recognition. Um, you know, so academically, you know, they pretty much finished me off, but <clears throat> so I went to the private sector. <laughs> okay. Started my own company where I'm off, you know, doing fascinating work, important work. Um, I have a new book that's in press climate uncertainty and risk should be out, you know, in nine months, sometime in 2023, the publication process is not quick, but that's, um, I think it will be an important and well-received book. Um, I'm, I'm helping people, governments, companies, um, make decisions about climate change you know, what they should be doing and not just about the environmental aspects, but the political aspects and the economic aspects as well. So I'm working and I'm working with even people at the level of farmers, not personally, but indirectly through an intermediary. So, you know, helping a range of people make better decisions and manage weather and climate risk. And that, that's what I'm trying to do. And like I said, the biggest risk right now is the so-called transition risk, trying to go to net zero too quickly using wind and solar. That's the biggest risk out there right now. It ties into a political agenda. Okay. Um, and you have to go back to the 1980s to understand where this comes from. You know, the UN Environmental Program. They they want world government. They don't like they don't like capitalism. You know, they they want they want you know they want power for themselves. They want world government. They want to. It, it's a power issue, and people and they latched onto global warming as the issue that could help achieve these goals. And then it you know developed a lot of momentum in the late 80s and the 90s. And this was before there was even any signal of warming. I mean, we just come off, we've been cooling since the 1940s, <laughs> have no warming, you know, and so, but they already had a treaty in place in 1992 before there was really any sign of warming. So, so this, you know, it's the, 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 pol the political and policy cart was way out in front of the scientific course right from the beginning. And then the IPCC framed, they were instructed to frame the problem, to look at dangerous human caused climate change. Don't tell us about natural climate variability. Don't tell us about whether warm is good. We want to hear about dangerous human caused climate change. You know, so it's just been politics, politics, politics right from the start. And then, you know, it's developed a lot of momentum. And if it chimes in with certain people's politics or environmental worldview, okay. And then, and then you've got Greta Thunberg, who's been enormously influenced on children with books. And now the children are being raised on this, all this alarmism, and it's become a huge psychological problem for children. You know, they're suicidal. Okay. They don't see that they have a life. Why should I bother to study when the world's going to end in 12 years and all sorts of nonsense that they're fed and they don't know how to filter and the adults in their lives feeding it to some, to some extent, but it's just become, you know, a big cult and, you know, common sense has just, you know, left the room. And, you know, the, 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 the thing with the kids is really bad because it's very hard to counter. And, and it's, it's a huge global problem. Kids being depressed and suicidal and thinking they don't have a future. <laughs> so how, how are, you know, what does that mean for the next generation of people who need to get educated, <laughs> you know, and be engineers and whatever? Not good. All, all for a political agenda, promoting, you know, to get rid, to get rid of fossil fuels. It, oh. it just makes no sense. Dr. Curry, 